So I'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us uh, here today for the Kirby Institute seminar series. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. Today's speaker is Professor Raina McIntyre, who will speak on questions for COVID-19 control. Professor McIntyre is Professor of Medicine at UNSW and an NH and MRC Principal Research Fellow. She heads the Biosecurity Program at the Kirby Institute and conducts research in epidemiology, vaccinology, bioterrorism prevention, mathematical modeling, public health and clinical trials in infectious diseases. Her areas of expertise include personal protective equipment, vaccinology, epidemic response and emerging infectious diseases. So just some housekeeping issues to start with. The format of the seminar will be um, uh, Professor McIntyre's presentation followed by a question and answer at the end. You can interact by typing your questions throughout the talk. To ask a question, click on the icon with a speech bubble and question mark in the top right corner to open the Q&A chat screen. When you click on ask a question, please remember to write your name. That will help us reference your question and make answering easier. You can also upvote any questions you would like to be answered and change the order of questions by clicking on the tab at the right of the Q&A chat, which says most recent and changing it to most liked. So uh, with that aside, I'd now like to hand over to Professor Raina McIntyre for her talk. I just unmute my microphone. Thank you, Miles. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, I know that there are some of you watching today who are interested mostly in the topic of school, children and teachers. So I'll start with that. But some of the material I'll cover later about transmission is also really relevant. So if you can, please um, listen to the rest of it as well. So depending on which studies you look at, children account for anywhere from 2 to 9.5% of all cases of COVID. The 9.5 figure comes from the United States, the 2% from China. Children are at much lower risk of complications and death. Um, now we do know that, the, that children under the age of 10 have lower expression of the ACE2 receptor in the nose relative to adults, and that's the receptor that the virus binds to. I'll talk a bit more about the receptor later. We also know that children with certain um, illnesses and, and comorbidities like genetic, neurologic, metabolic conditions or with congenital heart disease, obesity, diabetes, asthma, chronic lung disease, sickle cell disease are also at increased risk for severe illness. Some of the complications that children get include respiratory failure, intersusception, diabetic ketoacidosis, and the multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is the Kawasaki uh, disease-like syndrome, uh, which is a va diffuse vasculitis that children get. And of course, children can die. There, there have been deaths from zero upwards, so infants to very young children. Um, in the US, uh, depending on which state, uh, zero to 0.7% of all child COVID cases resulted in death. Uh, we do also know that there's a testing bias towards symptomatic people. So asymptomatic children may not get tested uh, um, and that could underestimate the actual rate of infection in kids. This is a graph showing the nasal gene expression of the ACE2 receptor in children and adults. And you can see in the kids under 10 on the left hand side here that it's lower then um, the next age group up, which is 10 to 17, and then older adults. So that could be certainly part of the picture, that the virus um, is, has fewer receptors to bind to in the upper respiratory tract. Now here's some data which was done by the National Centre for Immunisation Research and New South Wales Health in Australia, which looked at the first period of the pandemic in Australia from uh, March to April and looked at the number of uh, different schools which had cases of COVID. The blue is high schools and the red are primary schools. And they went out and tested um, all the kids in these schools that had cases, but they only found very few. Only one child had a positive antibody test four weeks after exposure, and only one additional case was diagnosed by a nose and throat swab. However, what you have to remember 
from these data is it, it was at a time when there was virtually no community transmission in Australia. So it's when you've got community transmission that you have to worry about what's happening in schools. At that time, it was mainly um, travel related cases coming in from overseas. There have been a number of school outbreaks documented globally in Mississippi very recently. In one outbreak, um, there was 144 te teachers infected and 292 students, over 4,000 students and 600 teachers quarantined. In Chile, um, nine almost 10% of students and almost 17% of staff were infected, which is very high. In the UK, they showed that staff members had an increased risk of infection compared to students in schools, and the majority of cases linked to outbra in outbreaks were staff. In Sweden, children, 4.7% uh, of school children were infected compared to 6.7% of adults aged 20 to 64, and 2.7% in 65 to 70. So whether that's because the older adults took more precautions and wore masks, we don't know, could be a behavioural issue, but we also know that transmission is much higher in young adults. Um, there was this um, population serological survey in Iceland where they took antibodies from a representative sample of the whole population and children under 10 were not did not have antibodies. So they inter a lot of people have interpreted this study as um, children under 10 having a much lower risk of getting infected. In this data has just been released from the US, um, from the Academy of Pediatrics in, in the US, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, they've had almost half a million child cases and that, that's 9.5% of all cases. Uh, 0.2 to 8.6 of those cases needed hospitalization. But once a child is hospitalized, their rate of needing to go to ICU is the same as an adult, about 30%. And then the outcomes are the same. Once you need to go to ICU, your outcomes are not so good. Interestingly, child cases increased by 21% between August 6th and the 20th, which is when the schools opened in the United States. And I'll show you a graph of that in a minute. <clears throat> um, there is uncertainty about how much transmission there is from and between children under the age of 10, but it's fairly clear that children over the age of 10 transmit and get infected at the same rate as adults. Um, some studies have shown that children have the same or higher viral loads in the nose and throat compared to adults and can spread the virus effectively in households and also in camp settings where there have been outbreaks. Interesting to look at the timing of school holidays. In France, the um, high school outbreaks declined sharply after the school holidays. And in Germany, in children under 19, um, cases increased by 10% in early May after schools reopened to nearly 20% in late June. In Israel as well, infections in children increased after schools reopened. Here's our first peak in Australia, which peaked at the end of March. And interestingly, um, cases were coming down, but I've labelled there the New South Wales and the Victorian school holidays. And how much that had with um, keeping the levels really down, we don't know, but no one's really looked at that. Here's the data from the US, which the American Academy of Pediatrics has put out. Um, on the right hand side in the green, you can see the percentage increase in child cases between the beginning and the middle of August. And it, it does correspond with opening of schools in the states that have the darkest green. So what about teachers and adults who live with school-aged children? Well, 40, uh, one study published in Annals of Internal Medicine showed that 40 to 50% of teachers and adults who live with a school-aged child have risk factors for severe complications of COVID. We know that many teachers have died in the US, in Sweden, in other European countries. Um, in France, in one high school outbreak, two infected teachers resulted in 38% of pupils 43% of teachers and 59% of non-teaching staff getting infected. In Jerusalem, in an outbreak, there were 153 students and 25 staff infected. There was an outbreak in New Zealand in a high school where 96% of people got infected, students, teachers, staff and parents. Um, it does seem that there are fewer outbreaks in daycare and primary school. However, in Texas, there's just been a report of a preschool outbreak in 800, uh, which have infected 894 preschool staff and 441 children across 
883 facilities tested in July, which was kind of the peak of the epidemic in Texas. Um, now, here's uh, uh, some interesting data on age-related difference in how much virus you've got in your nose, in your upper respiratory tract. And basically, the lower the value on the y-axis here, the cycle threshold, the more virus you have. So basically, the test has to cycle a certain number of times before you detect the virus. And if it, did, if it cycles uh, lots and lots of times, it means there's less virus there. So children under the age of five have more virus in their nose than children five to 17 and ch um, people over 18. So you can see the five to 17 and over 18 looks pretty similar, but children under five do have um, higher viral load in the nasopharynx. And this has been shown in, an, in a couple of other studies as well. This is a study from the Republic of Korea showing the difference, this is all children, the difference in children without symptoms with just an upper respiratory tract um, illness and with lower respiratory tract or pneumonia. So you can see that there's not a big difference in the um, time to clearing the virus between upper and lower respiratory tract infection, but the asymptomatic um, infections do clear slightly sooner. Um, and, you know, if you want 50% of people to be clear before you tell them you can go back to school or whatever, um, you're looking at more than more than three weeks, really, uh, close to four weeks for um, upper and lower respiratory tract infection, but maybe two and a half weeks for asymptomatic. So this is a, um, an, a comment from authors for an editorial on that paper saying um, a surveillance strategy that tests only symptomatic children will fail to identify children who are silently shedding virus while moving about their communities and schools in regions where face masks aren't widely accepted or used by the general public, asymptomatic carriers may serve as an important reservoir that allows the virus to spread. This is just a graph um, showing the difference between um, the virus in the rectal swabs and the nasopharyngeal swabs. So we know that the virus is in the feces. And all you need to take away here is that you can detect virus for longer in the rectal swabs um, up to 27 days and 21 days in the respiratory tract. So that's important with kids as well, that that was in children. This is um, some data from a school camp where there was an outbreak in the US. And just look at the attack rates here, 44% in total. Um, and then by age, 51% in the six to 10 year olds, 44% in the 11 to 17 year olds, and it gets lower as you get older. So very high attack rates in the littlest kids. Um, secondary attack rates are also very informative. This is a meta-analysis that tells you that overall in, fa in families, for example, the secondary attack rate is about 25%. So one in four people will get infected from the primary case. But then when you look at children versus adults, um, the secondary attack rates range from sort of 16 to 47% in adults and 5 to 27% in children. So it is a bit lower in children. That's children getting infected. However, when you look at these data, which is um, another study from the UK, which was from Public Health England, you can see that, <clears throat> just look, these are the characteristics of the contact. So the, the uninfected person in the household, and these are the characteristics of the infected person, the, the primary case. And you can see that for the uninfected contacts, the attack rate gets higher as you get older through the younger age groups, but it drops again to over 65. But all those attack rates are pretty high, you know, all more than one in four. But when you look at the uh, primary case, children under 18 who were infected resulted in 92% of their contacts getting infected, um, whereas it was 31% and 38% for the other age groups. So this study suggests that children under 18 were um, more infectious, which is consistent with the viral shedding data we just looked at. So some of the considerations in schools um, include the you, you know, use of indoor spaces, that's when the risk is going to be greatest. And uh, if there's lack of ventilation or if windows are shut, if the air conditioning is just recirculating the air, if there's social, no, if there's no social distancing, if you've got large groups. So some of the strategies you could use is small groups. Masks have been used in some countries, mandated in schools, including Israel, China, South Korea, Japan, 
Vietnam, Ghana and South Africa. Interestingly, in Israel, they stopped mask use for one week during a heat wave and they had a big outbreak two weeks later. So that's quite indicative that the masks did help. Um, certain high risk activities as well, um, like bus trips, excursions, where you're in a small closed space for long periods of time. Um, and then you need to think about risk factors for teachers also based on the individual risks of teachers, based on their age and what illnesses they may have. Basically, um, singing and shouting um, generate a lot of aerosols. So when you've got group, uh, group activities with kids, um, these are settings where you could get transmission. If you're inside a school hall, uh, lots of kids singing or shouting or talking loudly, uh, you'll get a lot of aerosol generation. And I'll show you some pictures of that later. So in summary, children do get infected, um, mostly mild or asymptomatic infection. It does seem that children under five have a higher viral load, but they also have less of the ACE2 receptors in their upper, in the upper and lower respiratory tracts. Um, do children under 10 transmit less than adults? The evidence really is mixed. So the UK study that I showed you suggests that child in primary school is 60 times more likely to infect others. Um, but, you know, partly I think it's about testing. It's that a lot of studies have only tested symptomatic children. They haven't tested the asymptomatic ones and so they haven't got the full picture. I would say, however, that high schools probably have a greater risk because we know their transmission is the same as in adults. Um, children are more, uh, sorry, teachers are more at risk than children in schools. Um, and I think the occupational health and safety of teachers needs to be a top priority if we're keeping schools open. Um, masks do seem to work. Um, and I think it's worth looking at those policies. Indoor settings are high risk. Um, and there's evidence from the US that reopening of schools is associated with increased epidemics. So in the US, they've um, developed this risk analysis matrix, a way of looking at um, the risk in schools. And they've basically based it on how much disease is in the community. So the red zone is if you're having more than 25 cases per 100,000 people. Interestingly, Victoria at the very peak of the epidemic was having 13 cases per 100,000 per day, daily cases. So Victoria would have fallen in the orange zone during that, that period. And then they have these recommendations of um, strategies based on what zone you're in. Um, and you can keep everything open if you're in the green zone. Um, and then you may, uh, you know, in this case, they're making the priority for reopening grades K to five. Um, and I think probably on the basis that, um, you know, because the, the thinking has been that little kids transmit less, so maybe on that basis, but I think that really needs to be re-looked at. So yeah, there are some, some guidelines there for people looking at um, ways to plan and um, strategize. So I'll move on to transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, this is um, um, a picture from some work that's been done by our PhD student Pratik Bal which is um, visualizing the aerosols that come out when you breathe and speak and um, cough and sneeze, etc. So I'll go back to the ACE2 receptors. Um, they're, they're in multiple different tissues, including the eyes, the central nervous system, the heart. There's been new data that's just come out showing that the actual cardiomyocytes die. So the virus invades the cardiomyocytes directly and so the individual heart cells die rather than you know, having a myocardial infarction and your heart muscle dying as a result, it can actually um, kill the muscle directly so that people um, can go into heart failure even without having an infarct. Um, it's in the kidneys, the gut, um, the liver, the lungs, uh, the vasculature, which is why it's such a vascular disease and the pathology is so um, predominantly vascular and the upper airways and uh, also the lower airways. Um, this is just a study showing the difference in the viral load between different specimens. So the orange is the sputum, which is representing the lower respiratory tract, the alveoli, the lungs, the bronchi. And then the uh, yellow is the swabs from the nose and the throat, so the upper respiratory tract. And the arrow there is when they seroconverted and the gray is the stool specimen. And the, each observation is one patient, okay? So generally for most patients, 
the sputum samples have a higher viral load than the upper respiratory tract specimens, which is telling you that, you know, the, the, the virus, there's more virus in the lower respiratory tract. So going on to um, the droplet versus airborne transmission, um, WHO defines large droplets as those which are greater than five microns in size and airborne if they're less than five microns. And this, there's a belief that only large droplets are emitted close to the patient and that smaller droplet nuclei, less than five microns, can travel at further distances and stay suspended in the air. This has kind of driven some of the guidelines we have in hospital infection control for over 80 years. And it's based on experiments from aerobiologists in the 1930s and 40s using photographic equipment that has since been clearly been superseded. And newer research using more sensitive cameras show that both small and large droplets can be present close to the patient and that large, even large droplets can travel much further than two meters. This is the original um, data from William Wells, which Pratik Bal found for us, um, our PhD student. And it shows that this, this experiment, he measured the time taken to fall two meters in a vertical distance from to the ground, from the air to the ground. And maybe this is where the, we think that somehow that two meter rule has been a mix up of interpretation of data. Um, that's the only, people keep talking about William Wells, but the only work that he did that um, looked at two meters was a vertical distance of droplets falling to the ground. So this is a systematic review done by Pratik again, um, which looked at all the evidence for horizontal distance travel by, by droplets. And basically most studies show that it, they can travel further than two meters. There's the two meter mark. Uh, most studies show that the large droplets can travel further than two meters. So what about the, um, the statement that SARS-CoV-2 is spread by droplet and contacts, contact? It's been an assumption from the outset and it's not based on data. There's been some retrospective justification based on the R0 of SARS-CoV-2, which is around um, anywhere from two to six based on different estimates. The US CDC puts 2.5 as its mid, mid estimate, but has four as its highest estimate. Um, and measles. So measles is an airborne virus and has an R0 of about 18. Um, R0 is a number of secondary cases that will result from one index case um, and is a measure of how infectious a virus is. However, R0 is not a measure of transmission mode. It's a function of the pathogen itself, the host and the environment. And it varies for any given pathogen for, by factors such as the population density. So the R0 for measles will be different in Sydney than it will be in Wagga Wagga um, and the environment. Um, so it can't tell you anything about transmission mode. Um, TB is airborne, for example, but usually has an R0 of less than one. Pertussis or whooping cough is said to be droplet spread, but has an R0 of 16 to 18. So the infectious dose is the other factor here, which differs for different airborne pathogens and explains why TB has a much lower R0 than measles, because measles has a very low infectious dose. So you'd only need, you know, a tiny amount of virus um, to be to be inhaled uh, to get infected, whereas TB you need more a higher infectious dose. The infectious dose for SARS-CoV-2 is not yet known. Um, interestingly, also measles and TB, which are both accepted as airborne, have never been isolated from air samples, but SARS-CoV-2 has in several studies. So the air we breathe is important in disease control. If someone emits large droplets near, near you, they'll also be emitting fine aerosols. Particles greater than 100 microns can settle very quickly, but particles less than five microns can re remain in the air for hours. Aerosols less than five microns can penetrate the lower respiratory tract, go straight to the alveoli through inhalation. And when we just breathing creates aerosols, this has been measured in numerous studies. Um, you can't see it in, with the naked eye, but breathing creates aerosols. So does talking, singing, shouting, and of course, coughing and sneezing. Medical procedures too create aer uh, aerosols, but um, the net amount of aerosol we produce is much greater from breathing and talking because we're doing that all the time. Toilet flushing as well is important, and that's been shown to cause massive upward transport of aerosols with virus particles. 
uh, with 40 to 60 percent of those particles rising above the toilet seat, leading to large scale spread indoors. Aerosolized material can be deposited on surfaces and then re aerosolized by human activity. Say it's on the bed sheets and you pick up the sheets and give them a shake or fold them, that activity itself can then re aerosolize those particles. The other important thing is that for aerosols accumulate in closed settings. If you're in an indoor setting like a hospital ward and the, the windows are shut and there's not very good ventilation, um, transmission is not likely to be a one hit event where suddenly a droplet comes and lands on your nose and you're infected. It's more likely to be from a result of cumulative exposure to these accumulated aerosols. Um, ventilation is really important. It disperses those aerosols. So breathing is an aerosol generating procedure. During normal breathing and talking, 80 to 90% of droplet sizes are actually less than one micron, which is tiny. Breathing and speaking occur more frequently than coughs and sneezes and may be more important in viral transmission, particularly from asymptomatic cases. Um, in one study, the average virus RNA load in oral fluid was seven to 10 to the six copies per mil, but some patients may exceed that by more than two orders of magnitude. There's about one in one study, they've estimated that there's a 37% prob probability that a five micron droplet prior to dehydration contains at least one virus, but that this probability is reduced to 0.37% for 10 micron droplets. So although very few particles actually carry viruses, the number of sm small particles far, far exceeds the number of large droplets. So one minute of loud speaking can produce thousands and thousands of oral droplets per second. And of these, at least a thousand virus containing droplet nuclei could remain airborne for more than eight minutes. SARS-CoV-2 genetic material has been found in the air in hospital nurses stations, in air handling grates, on surfaces, all over the hospital ward basically, even in areas distal from the patient room uh, and on air vents. Uh, particles greater than four microns and one to four microns containing a 1.8 to 3.4 viral RNA copies per cubic meter were found in two isolation rooms, despite those rooms having 12 air changes per hour. In Wuhan, traces of SARS-CoV-2 RNA in the air was found inside the patient mobile toilet room um, and in the medical staff areas, which was away from the ward and in the room where they remove their personal protective equipment. Um, the peak concentrations of the viral RNA in air appear in two distinct size ranges, 0.25 to 1 micron, which is really small, and greater than 2.5 microns, which is still really small, um, indicating that the viral virus containing aerosols are small enough to remain suspended. Here's a summary of the studies that show SARS-CoV-2 um, being likely to be airborne. Um, these are the first five are from hospitals and um, all of them found virus on the air vents. Uh, four of them found viral RNA in the air. Um, one of them found viable virus in the air. And um, in terms of persistence in the aerosols from all the different studies, um, in the hospital study, it was highest early in the illness but it ranged from three as 90 minutes to 16 hours. Um, these last uh, three studies are experimental. They all found um, viral RNA and vi viable virus in the air. And then there was this study in Italy, which um, found parti fine particulate matter, airborne particulate matter containing viral RNA in an industrial area of Bergamo in Italy, which was the epicenter of the um, COVID pandemic there. There's the electron microscopy um, uh, images from the FEAR study, um, which was one of the studies in that table there, which shows that um, the whole virus is, um, viable virus is present in the air. And on the right hand side is a graph where they show the spray factor, which is an indication of how aerosolized it is. And you can see that the, the average values are higher for SARS-CoV-2 than they are for SARS in all cases and um, in most of the cases for MERS coronavirus as well. So there's a hint there that SARS-CoV-2 may, may have more of a propensity to be aerosolized than MERS and SARS, which we do accept have airborne transmission.
Um, this was just a study um, looking at seasonal coronaviruses, actually, which in this study, they did show that the seasonal coronaviruses had more of a propensity to be airborne, um, aerosolized, um, and they just came out with normal breathing. Um, you could detect virus in the air. And when you put a mask on people with seasonal coronavirus, it completely blocked um, those fine aerosolized particles. Whereas for influenza, which is the middle panel, and rhinovirus, it didn't quite block everything. So masks are particularly effective for coronavirus, it seems. <clears throat> Here are some outbreaks with evidence of airborne transmission. There was one case documented of infection in a person who passed the open door of a patient room multiple times but never went in. Um, there was two bus trips, uh, two buses that went on a trip simultaneously. On one bus there was an infected person and people on that bus had 40 times the risk of infection. There were cameras on board which showed that there was no contact between people. And then there was a restaurant in um, China where diners greater than one meter from the index case who had no contact became infected. And then this one, um, which has just been published, which is uh, similar to the Amoy Gardens outbreak in Hong Kong, where um, people in an infected person in one building uh, resulted in infection in multiple floors of the building and in adjacent buildings. So in this case, there were five infected people on the 15th floor of an apartment block, and they found virus on the surfaces in the bathroom on the 16th floor in a vacant apartment just above. So there's no one living there, but there was virus all over the bathroom, which tells you that the surface contamination. Um, may well be from aerosol deposition, which is statistically more likely than from um, large droplet deposition, just because you produce so much more aerosol than large droplets. They did an on-site tracer experiment after flushing the toilets, and they were able to show aerosols all the way to the 25th and the 27th floor. And there were actually cases of infection on those floors. Then there were a couple of outbreaks in shopping malls as well uh, of people with, who didn't have contact. A call center in South Korea with an attack rate of 43% and a choir in the US with an attack rate of 86% of people getting infected. And there were other choir outbreaks as well, which I haven't included here. So just to go back to toilet hygiene, the, the role of fecal aerosols is important. Um, as I showed you in that case in the apartment block and also in the Amoy Gardens, uh, it's well documented that building transmission can occur through bathroom plumbing, especially if there's a faulty S-bend. Um, a study that I was involved in, which was in BMJ Global Health, showed four times the risk of infection in household contacts if the index case had diarrhea. Another study showed that the aircraft toilet was the main risk factor during an outbreak in an aircraft. Um, because the, the patient only took their mask off inside the um, toilet. Uh, so the, the take home messages there are if you've got someone who's self isolating at home or uh, even in quarantine, flush the toilet with the lid down, open the windows, turn on the vents and use disinfectant. Um, this is the review that's just come out, um, which really is a very comprehensive review of the evidence of aerosol transmission. Um, this is, uh, we use the criteria of Jones and Brosso to um, look at SARS-CoV-2 and really the evidence is pretty strong. It's got high plausibility, a score of eight out of nine for being airborne um, in the same range. It's in the same uh, range as TB in terms of the evidence. Um, uh, so Lydia Morawska, who I'm sure you've heard of, has published this paper recently as well, which talks about the importance of ventilation. So there are a lot of engineering controls that can be applied to make environments safer, ultraviolet light, air cleaning and disinfection, do not recirculate the air. Unfortunately, most air conditioners that you buy for your home, etc., cetera, uh, or re they recirculate the air. They do not have an option to bring in outside air. So just opening a window actually will have a big impact, but you can get portable air, air cleaners as well. Um, in terms of masks, uh, you know, I'm just going to show you this video again from Pratik Bal, our PhD student. It was just published in Thorax, which shows the impact of um, minimizing the aerosols being exhaled from someone during different uh, activities. 
with and without a mask and with different kinds of masks. So basically in the picture here, you know, if both, if everyone's wearing a mask, then your risk is really, really reduced. Whereas if only the sick person is wearing a mask, well, there's some reduction. If only the well person is wearing a mask, there's maybe some reduction. And if nobody's wearing a mask, well, you're, you're fully exposed to all those aerosols. So I'm just gonna, um, whoops. These are particles that you won't see with the naked eye. So what, what we've done here is um, used a method that visualizes what's coming out um, with sneezing, coughing, and just speaking. A one layered cloth mask at the bottom on the left, a surgical mask on the bottom on the right, and a two layered cloth mask at the top on the right. And you can see that any kind of face covering makes a difference, um, but two layers is better than one and three layers is better than two. That gives you an idea of how, just how much aerosol comes out. If that's speaking, the one you just saw. Okay, so this is another good paper that's just come out in BMJ that gives you a good way to look at risk. Again, it's the classic risk analysis framework. So it's looking at indoor and outdoor settings and how many people there are. So low occupancy is when there's few people, high occupancy when there's lots of people. Is it outdoors and well ventilated? Is it indoors and well ventilated? Is it poorly ventilated? You can think about a hospital this way. You can think about a school this way. Um, and what are the people doing in there? Are they silent? Are they speaking? Are they shouting and singing? Um, so basically, I think high uh, hospitals would probably fall somewhere here um, where there's a lot of people it's indoors probably poorly ventilated in a lot of cases maybe well ventilated in some cases um, where there's a lot of speaking going on as well as coughing and sneezing um, <clears throat> so airborne transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is real um, the WHO modified its position to accept that airborne transmission is possible in indoor settings in June um, there's more evidence, there's actually more evidence for airborne transmission than there is for the other modes of transmission. The equivalent levels of studies and data are not available to show that, you know, a large droplet caused the infection or contact caused the infection. In fact, I just saw a video of Anthony Fauci saying that he thought that um, contact was just a minor mode of spread, that it was mainly respiratory spread. And of course, as I said, measles and TB are accepted as airborne, but have never been isolated from the air, whereas SARS-CoV-2 has in multiple studies. We've seen numerous outbreaks with no contact and very high attack rates that also suggest airborne spread. Uh, and we've seen an instance like the Amoy Gardens uh, with an outbreak with floor-to-floor -floor spread in a building. And I think it's the combination of asymptomatic transmission with aerosol spread that means that universal face mask use will reduce transmission because you don't know who's infected. So somebody who's speaking to you for a prolonged period, you know, half an hour, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, um, is generating a hell of a lot of aerosols. And if, if you're wearing a mask and they're wearing a mask, that risk will really be reduced. And of course, we know that there's been a very high rate of infection in health workers wearing poor PPE. I'll move on now um, to healthcare workers. Now, I just wanted to put this picture up just to show you the difference in PPE between our healthcare workers on the left there in Victoria, going into one of the aged care um, outbreaks, versus the cleaners going in to clean up the Tattersall's gym after one person with COVID had been in there and has left. So our health workers are face to face with patients, multiple patients, you know, in an environment where there are active cases. And, um, you know, clearly the, the whoever's responsible for these cleaners took their occupational health and safety very seriously and gave them the maximal amount of pr protection. And that's quite a stark contrast, I guess. Health workers are known to be at risk of all infections, influenza, meningococcal disease, measles, viral hemorrhagic fevers, and COVID-19. Hospitals are closed indoor settings where aerosols may accumulate. Uh, in one study, influenza was shown to persist in the air of the emergency department three hours after an influenza patient had left the ED. And hospitals are highly contaminated environments. Um, 
we all know the hierarchy of controls that, you know, really ideally you want to eliminate the risk or substitute, use engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE is the last resort. But in practice, there's not much we can do to eliminate or substitute um, because, you know, hospitals have patients in them that have COVID-19 and our healthcare workers are exposed. Um, to potential risk. Engineering controls we can do something about, administrative controls we can, and PPE. Um, I Perhaps uh, other people can comment on this, but I'm not aware of, um, you know, there's a wide variation in hospitals and the degree of um, good engineering and, and uh, design in wards. So PPE protocols are needed anywhere where there's going to be risk, um, airports and quarantine, first responders, hospitals, primary care, public health, and also people managing decontamination and waste. And that includes awareness and triage, assessment of hazard, equipment selection, training in PPE use, actual use of PPE, donning and doffing, and disposal of the PPE. This is just one of the several studies that have shown extensive contamination in the hospital ward. Um, and the floor in this study, the floor was particularly contaminated, the floor and the air vents. Um, and um, we've seen healthcare worker deaths in many countries, over 3,000 healthcare worker infections in Victoria. Um, studies in two NHS trusts in the UK found one in five health workers were infected with COVID-19, which is really incredibly high. Um, and there's been a large outbreak in, in several hospitals described in the Netherlands. Um, and as I said, multiple studies showing contamination of hospital wards, not just in, in the immediate patient area, but in areas like down the corridor, in the pharmacy, in the doctor's um, tea room, et cetera. So, um, and there's also studies that show that there's an increased risk of um, infection in health workers who faced a shortage of PPE. This has just come out. And it did show that um, people who reported that they had difficulty accessing adequate PPE were more likely to get infected. This is the outbreak in the Netherlands and um, there was community transmission as well as transmission in the hospitals, which are the boxes, the squares are the healthcare workers, the triangles are the patients. So you can see that some patients were infected, but a lot of healthcare workers um, and other people also got infected. Um, this is just from an outpatient obstetric service showing that they decided to test all, the, this was in uh, in the US, I think, and um, they decided to test all the patients coming in to this obstetric service and found about 15% actually had SARS-CoV-2 and um, most of those were asymptomatic. So these are young women, obviously, in an obstetric service. So another thing for health workers to be aware of where there's a lot of community transmission that in any clinical service where you're seeing um, young people, you might have a high level of asymptomatic uh, infection. We've also seen a number of countries where there's been a low rate of health worker infections where health workers have been wearing high levels of PPE. In Taiwan, um, they've had almost zero health worker infections in this one study where um, the health workers wore um, the, what's what would be called the level three protection in that picture there, which is from China. Uh, and then in China, um, there was a hospital, Sun Yat-sen hospital that sent staff to Wuhan to help out. Um, and they gave them the optimal PPE, um, including respirators and Tyvek suits and the full um, uh, PPE, and none of them got infected. Um, some data from the UK showed that um, the, the uh, clinicians who used respirators and high level PPE didn't, didn't die. All the deaths were in clinicians who were um, not in those kind of specialist services where they would get a respirator. Um, Singapore has also put out some data on the use of the clean space PAPA um, to protect their healthcare workers. There was a Lancet meta-analysis which showed that um, surgical masks were 67% effective against beta coronaviruses, N95s 96% effective. Um, there's also been some studies showing a higher risk of infections in nurses and general staff than say intensive care specialists. Um, and also workers with no patient contact have become infected during nosocomial outbreaks, such as, you know, ward clerks and cleaners and um, 
so on, suggesting that there is a distal risk beyond the patient care area. Um, before the resurgence in Victoria, we started collecting data on the different outbreaks in Australia. And these are some of the outbreaks we collected data on. And the, the thing to note here is you've not just got your infected cases, so 84 infected health workers in um, Tasmania, but then that requires a large number of staff to be quarantined. So your workforce can take a massive hit. In the case of Tasmania, over a thousand health workers had to be quarantined. The hospital had to be shut down, uh, which is another reason to really do everything to stop health workers getting infected. Here's the epidemic curve for Victorian healthcare workers um, released by the Victorian Department of Human Services. Um, that's the epidemic in the first wave. In the second wave, you can see a huge number of cases in aged care and disability workers. And that's because, you know, aged care is not a healthcare setting. It's a residential setting and the workers there largely are not registered health workers. They are, um, they are, they are carers. Um, many of, uh, and very few nurses are generally, there might be one nurse in an aged care facility, but the majority of staff are not health workers. So the level of training and, and um, understanding about PPE is less as well, which may place them at greater risk. But here you go in the blue, the turquoise, that's the nurses. Huge number of infections in nurses, medical practitioners as well in the green. You have to remember there's many more nurses than there are doctors. So what we really wanna see is the rates. I didn't have time to calculate them, I meant to, um, but we wanna look at the rates in doctors and nurses by the denominator. Um, and this is a breakdown um, in the first wave at the top, in the top section there and the bottom is the second wave. And the major vast majority of people, 80% were assessed to have got it in the workplace. Um, so let's go back to aerosol generating procedures, which is an, of interest to health workers. Just to remind you again that speaking and breathing are aerosol generating procedures, as are shouting, coughing and sneezing and medical procedures. Um, this, there's a study that's just come out in BMJ, which, um, and this is their, their fundamental argument. The ter term aerosol generating procedures became popular after SARS in 2003, when small retrospective studies showed um, an association between transmission to health workers and the use of procedures such as intubation, et cetera. This is weak evidence and, uh, you know, that aerosols weren't measured. They also said, furthermore, nurses were more commonly infected than doctors performing procedures. I don't know if they worked out the rates there, suggesting that proximity and time exposed to the patient is more important than the procedures themselves. Um, acutely ill patients do present additional risks from coughing, labored breathing, airway collapse, and sputum production, high viral loads, which is true. There's a lot of risk in the healthcare setting that's not just related to AGPs. We did do this study actually, um, published in 2014, looking at the risk of laboratory confirmed viral or bacterial infection from a multiplex viral and bacterial PCR. Um, and um, high risk procedures, as we call them, which included intubation, suctioning, um, chest physiotherapy, et cetera. Um, the risk was three times higher of having a lab confirmed infection with those bacterial or, or viral respiratory infections. Um, so yes, there is a higher risk, um, but there's also a lot of aerosols generated in the clinical setting. I'm not really not going to go into the PPE data from our research because I've done that in the in one of the past talks, and you can look that up on YouTube through the Kirby seminars. Just to remind you that um, surgical masks, you know, when you pull all the data, surgical masks. Um, they probably are protective, but to a lesser degree and not significantly protective in these data. Um, the only significant protection you get is from N95 respirators, even against infections that are assumed to be droplet spread. And all that's telling you is that you can't separate infections into droplet and airborne because that, that paradigm is a false paradigm. I'm only going to touch on this because um, a lot of people are using this trial um, that we did a number of years ago now to say that fit testing is not necessary. That is absolutely wrong. And it is said, we say so in the paper that um, the product that was used in this trial, the N95 that was used in this trial was the Rolls-Royce of products that was based on some testing that had been done prior, um, which showed a high rate of fit test failure for most other respirators. And that's why we chose this particular product. So it was a really good product. 
Um, and it, the findings of this study are only specific to the respirator used in this study. You cannot um, generalize it to other respirators. Um, just to remind you that the SARS Commission, um, which was uh, looking into the debts of healthcare workers in Toronto following SARS, tale of two cities, but in Vancouver, they gave their healthcare workers respirators. No, there was no outbreak, no one died. In Toronto, they had the same argument we're hearing today, saying it's droplet spread and you don't need a respirator. And they had a massive outbreak with over 300 healthcare workers infected and three died. So there was an inquiry afterwards, um, and this quote just summarizes it all. That one example was a debate during SARS over whether SARS was transmitted by droplets or airborne. The point is not who was right or who was wrong. When it comes to worker safety in hospitals, we shouldn't be driven by the scientific dogma of yesterday or even the scientific dogma of today. We should be driven by the precautionary principle that reasonable steps to reduce risk should not await scientific certainty. So really, um, in making recommendations for respiratory protection of health workers, we need to consider mul multiple factors. We need to consider occupational health and safety obligations, disease severity and case fatality. Makes a lot of difference if it's you know, influenza or COVID-19 because the case fatality rates orders of magnitude different. Um, you need to think about what uncertainty is there around the parameters and the modes of transmission. And we still have a lot of uncertainty around SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know. We're learning new things every day. We need to also think about the modes of transmission, but that's only one factor. We need to think about, are there any drugs or vaccines available to treat healthcare workers if they get sick? And the answer is no right now. So that makes it even more important to provide adequate protection. And we need to think about equity and consistency in recommendations. So laboratory staff are recommended for a respirator, clinical staff for a surgical mask. <clears throat> this is a good way of looking at risk, uh, which is really around a study that was published in New England Journal that was around um, returning to work. When can you say people can go back to work? So you need to look at a range of factors, and we should be doing this in healthcare as well, looking at what's, what's the risk of death from SARS-CoV for an individual healthcare worker? What's the occupational risk based on your setting? Are you in the outpatient clinic? Are you in ICU? Where are you in the hospital? Um, and, you know, you can easily construct a risk uh, framework like this that'll make it much easier to make, um, to protect people. Other considerations include the healthcare workers' age, what comorbidities they have, what are their clinical roles? And I think there's a lot of subspecialties where there's procedures or patients that um, may be, um, you know, have decreased cognition or, or behavioural issues that place the clinicians at risk. ENT, ophthalmology, psychiatry, emergency, ICU, gastroenterology, all those endoscopies, definitely aerosol generating procedures, respiratory physicians doing the bronchoscopies, et cetera. Cardiologists as well do a lot of interventional stuff, geriatric, surgery, anesthetics. And then we need to think about the non-clinical personnel, the cleaning staff, the ward clerks, the, the food, food service um, personnel, et cetera, as well, and um, protect them. This is, um, I've just adapted this from a CBRN um, risk pyramid. And I think we could easily do something like create red zone, yellow zone, green zone. So red zone might be an area where there's significant contamination with COVID-19 because there are active cases there. So it might be the ward, the COVID ward. Um, and the area is presumed to pose an infection risk from both contact and inhalation. So that would be level A protection. Yellow zone where there's contamination is possible. So maybe on the gastroenterology ward. Um, but there's no active cases known and initial monitoring exists. And the green zone is areas of con where contamination is unlikely, um, which covers the area beyond the expected significant dispersal range of active cases. That might be the offices where the um, adm administration sits in the hospital. So just to finish off, I'll just touch very briefly on vaccines. I'm not going to talk about the vaccine um, um, the, the different methods of vaccine development, but I will touch briefly on reinfection, which is very important for vaccine development because this report from, um, from the US has just come out. We heard about the case of reinfection from Hong Kong to genetically different viruses in um, March and then in August. Another case report, a couple of cases in Europe, and this case in, in the US actually said to have a much more severe illness the second time around, which is what we worry about, phenomenon called antibody dependent enhancement. And um, that's a concern with vaccines that um, everyone's worried about. I would say that um, 
the antigen that's thought to be responsible for antibody dependent enhancement is the nuclear capsid antigen. So vaccines that don't have that antigen probably have a lower risk of being um, uh, causing ADE. So we've got about nine candidates in phase three trials at the moment, which is excellent news. Um, the phase one, two data are looking very promising. Australia is already you know, looking to procure and get licensed to manufacture. Being able to manufacture vaccine is really important because probably the richest and most powerful countries will buy up everything and everyone else will be in line. So if you've got capacity to manufacture, to get a license from whoever's developed the vaccine to manufacture domestically, it'll be much better. Uh, we, we will likely face shortages initially because none of the manufacturing procedures are at, um, able to provide enough vaccine at scale. WHO and CEPI have an uh, initiative called COVAX, which is to ensure that every country gets a minimal amount of vaccine, maybe for the first responders, et cetera, which Australia has signed up to. Uh, just to, you know, I just want to raise this fact that the last time mass vaccination was used in the world was smallpox. We have a birth cohort of about 300,000 infants every year. So that's the birth cohort that gets their vaccines at two, four, six months, et cetera. Um, the over 65s who get flu vaccine, it's 3.8 million people. So our system is set up to vaccinate, you know, maybe about four and a half million people a year. We're looking at having to vaccinate 25 million people. At the moment, vaccination is delivered through GPs and also there's some school-based programs such as the HPV vaccine where kids are vaccinated in year seven. Um, generally for those programs that are outside of the general practice, the vaccinators are nurses who are accredited, vac accredited vaccinators. You've got to do a particular course to be an accredited vaccinator and there's very few um, nurse, nurse vaccinators out there. So if we're looking at having to vaccinate the whole Australian population, I think we need to upscale the capacity for nurse vaccinators. We need to really look at the capacity and the infrastructure of how we're going to do it. Um, lessons from smallpox, we never used a mass vaccination in Australia. We had vaccination programs when there were outbreaks, but the whole population wasn't vaccinated as they were in the US and the UK. Um, when, you know, it's very likely that initially we'll have a limited supply of vaccine. So we've got to think, how are we going to use that vaccine? Are we going to use ring vaccination, which is something that was developed from smallpox, where the mass vaccination program was just failing. The India was like the last stronghold of smallpox and they just couldn't get everybody vaccinated. It was too hard to get access and you know, lots of different issues. But then they switched to a ring vaccination strategy, which is where you chase the outbreaks, vaccinate all the contacts, and that actually what led to the eradication of smallpox. However, um, for it to be effective, for ring vaccination to be effective for COVID-19, the vaccine must have efficacy as post-exposure prophylaxis. Some vaccines do, like hepatitis A, measles, they can all be used in an outbreak um, after people have been exposed and they still have efficacy. Smallpox, the efficacy was less than if you'd never been exposed, but it still did have efficacy. Um, so we don't know yet whether the COVID vaccines will have that efficacy to be used as ring vaccination. First responder vaccination is probably the highest priority, so the healthcare workers will get it first, hopefully. Um, the other options are age-based vaccination, where you select an age group, whether it's older people because they have the highest risk of dying, or younger people because they've got the most risk of transmitting. And then there's other ways of targeting the strategy. This is just some work we did with smallpox, which showed that uh, basically what it shows with all these targeted strategies is it doesn't make a lot of difference if you've only got limited number of doses because you're nowhere near reaching the herd immunity threshold. That's just looking at that a bit closer. You probably can control, you can impact the epidemic more by vaccinating younger people, but you'll prevent more deaths by vaccinating older people. What about delay? Um, this, this, I'm just showing you this so that, you know, we, we can't afford a slow trickle vaccination program where it takes two or three years to get the whole population vaccinated because we just don't have enough vaccinators and we don't have enough vaccine. And it's like a slow trickle. Every week of delay will matter. You know, if you've got community transmission, um, the quicker you get the vaccination program done, the quicker you'll control it. Um, if you drop You'll drop the ball with your case isolation and contact tracing. Um, again, you will have a much larger epidemic. Um, and then we were quite interested in this issue of um, the critical threshold for a catastrophic epidemic. 
And we found that it was somewhere between 60 and 50 and 60 percent of, you know, finding your cases, isolating them, contact tracing and vaccination. And at 53 percent, the epidemic just blows out hugely. So there will be a threshold at which you've got to maintain those strategies of case isolation, contact tracing. A lot of countries have talked about dropping the contact tracing, including Australia early on. And that's just a very um, bad thing to do. Um, again, if you if you jump on it quickly and have a really effective vaccination program, you'll save the number of vac. You'll have you'll need less vaccine. The lessons from smallpox are you don't need mass vaccination. You can actually do it through ring vaccination, and then you can once you've controlled it, you can afford to slowly vaccinate everybody. But um, the worse the epidemic, the larger the number of doses. Okay, so I'll finish up there. Um, just to just to briefly say that um, we need to think about who the priority groups are. We need to think about how we're going to scale up vaccination capacity from four million to twenty five million people. How are we going to train all the more nurse vaccinators? Are we going to have drive through vaccination clinics like we have the testing centers? Um, and what efficacy will we have? If we've got 100% efficacy, we only need 70% of people vaccinated to get herd immunity and stop transmission. If, however, we only have a vaccine that's 50% efficacious, we won't get herd immunity through it. Thank you. Okay, thank you um, very much, uh, Raina. Now, um, Raina's appeared, uh, agreed to go a little bit um, over time to answer some questions. Um, so uh, starting, I think there's around 60 questions. So uh, my apologies in advance if uh, we don't get the questions or if the answer's um, a, a little short. So starting with the um, uh, most uh, common question or the one that was voted up, and I can't see how you can answer this uh, in a short time, but the question is, what do we know about COVID-19 in August that we, we did not know in February or March 2020? So number one, we know that there is massive asymptomatic transmission. That, that wasn't even accepted back then. Back then we thought it's only transmitted from people who are showing symptoms, so you can easily identify who's infected. That's the most important thing that we know that we didn't know then. Second thing is we know that it can be spread through the aerosol or airborne route. The third thing is we know that it's a massively vascular disease. Um, a lot of the pathology is actually in the blood vessels, even in the lungs. Um, we know that there are really strange and chronic complications uh, and there's it's still an unfolding picture, but we now know that things like Kawasaki syndrome or the multi-system inflammatory thing weren't known about back then. Uh, we didn't know that people can be left with cognitive deficits, um, with um, chronic fatigue syndrome and all kinds of long-term effects. Okay, um, the, the next one is, I guess, somewhat political one. Should mandatory mask usage be considered in New South Wales? I think it should. Um, you know, it's not like you're asking people to take some dangerous drug. You know, it's a simple, cheap, effective, safe intervention. And as you saw from the video with the aerosols, it'll make a huge difference. And with any non-pharmaceutical intervention or even a pharmaceutical intervention, the earlier you do it, the more impact it will have. Um, in most countries that have mandated masks, they've waited till after the peak of the epidemic. In Victoria, in New York, you know, they brought in the mandate quite late in the piece. If it's brought in early, you'll end up with a smaller epidemic. And I'll just skip a couple to keep on that same theme. Um, and another question is that in Victoria, uh, they're advising that a face covering rather than a face mask is acceptable. Um, that face shields might be an alternative. Um, would you comment on the effectiveness of face shields versus masks? There's been some data coming out from Switzerland and a couple of other places where uh, in settings where people have had a choice between wearing a face shield and a face mask, only the people wearing a face shield have got infected, which again tells you that a lot of the transmission is aerosol or airborne. The face shield has a gap at the bottom there. So when you breathe in, the air has to flow down underneath the face shield and you breathe it straight in without any filtration. So um, that, you know, a face shield really should only be an adjunct to a mask. Okay, that's pretty clear. Um, next one, is public transport a reservoir for the virus due to the constant circulation of the same air? Yes, it is. I mean, uh, you know, we've been told that there's been upgrading of ventilation, etc., on buses, but like I said, there was a hospital ward where they had 12 air changes an hour and they still had um, 
huge amounts of viral virus everywhere. So um, a bus is a very small environment as well. It's small, there may be lots of people on it, so the risk is quite high on a bus. I'd just open all the windows if I had to be on a bus and I'd wear a mask. Um, and I guess um, back to the issue of surface transmission, there's a question, given the virus lives on surfaces for an extended period, is it necessary to sanitise groceries and parcels? Um, I think it depends on the amount of community transmission. You know, um, in Melbourne at the peak of the epidemic, probably yes. You know, if you're in WA, probably no. <laughs> Um, another one, since droplets can travel more than two metres, should distancing guidelines be revised and physical distancing increased? Look, the, um, the Lancet meta-analysis that I mentioned on the masks and respirators also looked at distance and basically one metre of distance will protect you substantially, but every metre thereafter will double your protection. So any distance between you is good. If you can only manage one, depending on what the setting is, that's better than none. And if you can manage two metres or even further, that's even better. Uh, now, this sounds like a recipe for your next experiment. Um, we understand that singing and shouting um, can transmit, but has there been any peer-reviewed research on musical instruments, clarinets, trumpets, etc., because school bands have been stopped in New South Wales? Is this supported by the evidence? So there is a um, study that's been done in the US um, showing that there is quite a lot of um, aerosolization from brass instruments, particularly anything where there's a lot of, you know, blowing and uh, force of blowing. Um, we've got a paper that's coming out in clinical infectious diseases on singing, um, which has some of those visualization experiments done on the singing. Um, so unfortunately, uh, yeah, I, I think there is some evidence that um, the brass instruments particularly, I would expect woodwind as well, um, but I haven't seen anything on that. Um, I think there's another mask question I might um, skip over, just asks whether we should have started masks earlier, and I'm guessing your answer is yes, based on that. Yeah. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on the theory that previous immunizations may have had a protective effect? Um, um, uh, there are no previous immunizations for COVID. Um, however, exposure to seasonal coronaviruses um, seems to be important. It's estimated about 30% of people have cross-reactive antibodies that have been generated from exposure to the cold and flu virus coronaviruses. Um, whether or not they are protective or associated with antibody-dependent enhancement, we don't know yet. There's still a little bit of uncertainty around that. So I think a lot more research is needed on uh, the role of pre-existing antibodies. Um, are there any studies on pregnant women with COVID-19 infection and the effects on the unborn baby? Uh, yes, there are. Um, at the end of my slides, I had a link to some resources that I've collected um, and you can go in there and have a look. There's a few studies on um, um, pregnant women and uh, Generally, the effect on pregnant women is, is there, there have been infants who have been infected from their mother. Um, whether it happened during the birth process or vertically, we don't, not, is uncertain. Um, but the outcomes for the mother themselves in some studies don't seem to be worse than if they weren't pregnant because they're young, I guess, young women, yeah. Um, so uh, I'll skip over another mask one because if, if the answer is we should all be wearing masks, I guess it applies to all circumstances. Um, how much uh, do we know about the risks of getting reinfected? You you commented on the potential antibody dependent enhancement. But... So we know that there's been several reports um, of reinfection. They were right from the beginning, but some of the early reports were probably just persistent viral shedding from people from their first infection. We know that it was it's possible with seasonal coronaviruses, okay? There have been challenge studies with seasonal coronaviruses that show that you can definitely get reinfected, but the second time round, in that case, um, you, you don't tend not to get symptoms, so it definitely reduces the severity. Um, I think it's just too early and there's not enough studies to really know what it's going to mean for, for COVID-19. Okay, um, well, um, we still have another 50 questions there, but uh, being 10 past two, perhaps we should um, uh, wrap it up there. So I'd like to um, thank uh, Professor McIntyre very much uh, for her uh, uh, talk and her generous time in answering the questions, um, and also thank Rata and Elaine who've been organising things behind the scenes. Um, thanks very much.